And meantime, over on Capitol Hill, Congress and the White House still haven't reached a deal on the debt ceiling as we race towards the June 1st deadline, where the country could run out of money to pay its bills. Some White House officials have floated leaning on the 14th Amendment to make sure that the U.S. doesn't default. Now, joining us to talk about all of the above is a friend of the show and former prosecutor, Congressman Glenn Ivey. Congressman, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. So the 14th Amendment, you think about protecting civil rights here. You don't think about uh, protecting the fight over the debt limit and giving the president more power. So what exactly is the argument here and do you buy it? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I kind of, uh, I, I want to be careful about us going down that path. Um, because it's, uh, you know, arguably the basis of it is that the, the 14th Amendment requires, uh, you know, pr protection for, their, it enables the president to move forward when, and, and pay the debts um, so, that, so, so that we wouldn't run, necessarily run into a debt default scenario. The problem is it's an untested theory and we don't actually really know how it would play out. And I think it could take quite a long time for it to work its way through the courts. And as you know, we only have a few weeks, if that, to, to get this resolved. Right. So I don't think it's a viable option here, but, you know, we'll see how things move forward. Well, speaking of untested theories and switching gears a little bit, Trump's lawyers in New York are saying that prosecutors are pushing some untested theories in his criminal case. And I want to lean on your expertise here as a former state prosecutor, because Trump is asking to move his case out of state court, a criminal case, into federal court. Now, we see this happen all the time in the civil world, or at least more often than we do in the criminal world. Did this ever happen? Happened to you, and what do you think his chances are? Um, no, I, I've never seen it in a criminal context. Uh, in fact, I thought the change of venue uh, move that they would make would be to try and move it to a different uh, court within the state of New York. In other words, get it out of New York City, get it out of Manhattan, um, arguing, I think, in part that uh, they'd want to have a, a, a shot at a jury that's not so deeply blue uh, and might be more purple. But and you know, they chose to try and go to federal court, which would still keep it roughly within Manhattan. Uh, so I don't know that that helps them with respect to the jury selection piece. And I, but I don't think it's likely to get moved to federal court in any event. So I, it's an interesting move. We'll see what the, the trial court does with it. But I, I don't think it's going to be granted. I also want to ask you about this latest decision that we saw from a federal judge out of Richmond saying that bans on selling guns to people under the age of 21 years old, unconstitutional in light of the Supreme Court's, of course, now landmark, but recent decision in New York State Rifle and Pistol Association v. Bruin. What is your reaction to that decision? Well, you, you don't agree. With, I don't agree with it. But, you know, the Bruin decision changed the standard for how you, uh, you know, judge these cases. And so I think you're going to see a lot of rulings that are uh, unintended consequences of what they did. So basically, the, the change that Bruin made was to say um, the way to evaluate any, count, any case that, uh, you know, implicates the Second Amendment is to look back to 1791 and see what the rules were then or leading up to that time frame. Um, and so, for example, you know, we, we have a lot of gun laws in place, like serial numbers on guns. Are, we, there, are, there are courts that have found that uh, that's not in compliance with the Second Amendment, even though it's a huge piece of a lot of the, uh, the, the gun laws that are in place already. So you're, you're going to see a lot of challenges to gun laws. Um, some of them I think the you know, conservatives will agree with. Some of them I think they're, they're going to find surprising. Uh, and it's going to take a while to sift all this out. I think the Supremes are going to have to speak on this again uh, in the very near future. Just quickly here at the end, any traction on Capitol Hill at the moment for any kind of agreement on any kind of gun reform? Well, you know, well, you never know. I've had uh, some conversations with Republicans about potentially taking a look at some, you know, but but no, nothing I think is really moving forward at this point. And I'd be surprised if anything significant got passed uh, while the Republicans are, you know, uh, in the majority in the House. So I think, you know, we have to keep working at it, but I don't see anything coming in the near future. Well, Congressman Glenn Ivey, a range of questions for you. We could be talking all day, but thank you for spending just a few minutes with us tonight. Thank you.